much more Good morning and a big welcome to St George's live stream on the 26th of July. If you don't know me, my name is Beth Keenan and I'm on staff here at St George's working mainly with youth and communications. We have a great live stream put together this morning and I hope you can see the effort and love and care that people have put in. The Bible passage that we're looking at today focuses on kingdom authority for a story of David. Kingdom authority. I think that's pretty exciting. To start us off this morning, I wanted to read out a short Bible verse from Acts. This, this takes place after Jesus' death, as well as after his resurrection and ascension. A man called Paul, who'd once persecuted followers of Jesus, was in Rome, and this was said about him. This is Acts 28, 30 to 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Amazing. So a man who has persecuted followers of Jesus then is proclaiming the kingdom of God with boldness and without hindrance. Let's just have a moment of quiet, maybe close your eyes and in a moment I'll pray. Heavenly Father, this morning is all about you. May your kingdom be proclaimed in boldness as we meet together. Lord Jesus, to whom authority is given, we humble ourselves before you. Holy Spirit, cause our hearts, souls, minds and strengths to exalt your holy name through listening to your word, singing worship and joining close with people even when we are physically far apart. Amen. And next up, we have got a story from the lovely Rosie. Then Ben Forbes, our new curate, will be sharing some all-age thoughts, followed by the smart family and guest showing us for the second time a new song that they've introduced. It even features some pretty cool dressing up. Our story today is about how God chose a young boy called David to become the king over all of Israel. Israel's old king was not doing a very good job because he decided to listen to himself and not to God. So God chose David to be the new king and he was anointed with oil. God knew that David was good and God knew that David trusted him. And God knew that when David grew up, he was going to make a very good king. But before David was crowned, he was sent to help the old king, who was very, very troubled. The old king was very, very far from God and was very sad that he hadn't been a good king because he had ignored God. The old king was so troubled that the only way he could be cheered up was by someone playing music to him. So David went to help him by the playing the harp for him. Even though David knew that he was going to be king one day, and even though David knew that the old king was doing a bad job, he went and lived with the new king and began to help him in whatever way he could. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard many stories about King David and some of the things he did, particularly when he got a little bit older, including killing a man called Goliath. David did grow up to be a very good king. Isn't it amazing that God was using him even when he was so young? Isn't it amazing that God knew that, when, that he was going to grow up to be such a good king and decided to use him even before he was crowned? God knew David and God knows us. God knows us better than anyone else knows us. God knows us better than we even know ourselves. God even knows how many hairs we have on our heads. How crazy is that? The God of the whole universe, who created all the stars in the sky, and all the fish in the sea, and all the birds in the air, knows each of us better than we know ourselves. Also, how brave is David in this story? He went from looking after sheep, to looking after the king. 
before he was anointed to be the next king of Israel, the shepherd boy, who was the youngest and smallest amongst his brothers, and who was working with the sheep, which would have been an exhausting, dangerous, and quite frankly, smelly job, was all of a sudden asked to be looking after the king. God changed everything for him. God promises that he will be made king one day, and he makes a way for him to live in the palace with the old king before he's even crowned. That must have been an enormous change for him. Looking after smelly sheep one day, then looking after the king the next. Because he, and but God, helped him. And so he did the job brilliantly. Sometimes doing new things can be scary for us. Sometimes doing something that's very different from what we have done before seems really difficult. Because God, but God was with David. And God is with us. The Bible says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When God is there to give us strength, anything is possible, no matter how difficult, no matter how new, no matter how scary. That's really cool. So, God knows you. And God can help you. So let's think, just for a minute. What would you like God to help you with this week? What new thing might you want to do this week with God's help? Anything is possible with God and God knows you. So what might he be wanting you to do this week? We're now going to go over to the Smart family who are going to lead us in our song. So hopefully now everyone who's at school has broken up for the summer holidays. I think we can all agree it's been a pretty unusual couple of terms. And I hope that during the holidays you'll have a chance to do some fun stuff and maybe get out and about. But today my challenge to you is going to be hard for some and easy for others. You'll need a towel or a blanket, a cushion, and somewhere safe to lay down outside. 
it's probably best to do it in the morning or late afternoon so the sun's not high in the sky at the end of all the busyness and difficultness of the school term my challenge to you is to be still your target is to lie still for five minutes if you can or less if that's too hard look up in the sky for cloud pictures close your eyes and listen for the sounds you can hear and just be still hello so we are back with the lovely rosie weber um, and <laughs> with our little segment of our story journey so Rosie, could you tell us a bit about how your journey with faith started? Yeah, of course. Um, so I've always been, I've been brought up in a Christian household. Um, I went to church on Sundays, went to Sunday school, uh, went to a Christ Church of England school. Um, I was very much a part of the choir and the church and all of that sort of stuff at school. Um, I suppose where it really starts is probably after uni because during my uni years I sort of drifted away from my faith and didn't really, well, I didn't pay attention to, to God or our relationship or anything like that. Um, it was almost like it was put on the back burner. Everything was sort of quite overwhelming and I just sort of, I guess I just sort of tried to fit in um, with my uni friends and, and none of them were Christian and it was just sort of a, um, I don't know, I sort of, I'm not really sure what happened, but basically I stepped away for a little bit. Um, and it wasn't until last year when I took the Alpha course um, that I really started to explore it again um, at St George's. So yeah. Oh, nice. And um, was there like a point where kind of God and faith became real when you had to make a commitment kind of thing? Yes, um, so I'd be doing the Alpha course for a little bit um, and I think it was good, yeah in fact it was, it was Good Friday of that year and we'd had some friends over from the church and we, I was helping dad to afterwards lock up and that sort of thing, lock the house up and we went out into the garden and it was so, so stunning, like purely like clear skies, you know, you could see the stars, it was gorgeous. And I just broke down, and I don't know where it came from, um, but I guess it just sort of, it was just that time. I, I decided that that was the moment that I really wanted to commit myself to God and to um, to really show that this is what I wanted. Um, and I think Dad cried a bit as well <laughs> at some point. <laughs> we were a bit of a mess. Um, but it was really something. Um, and then when we went on the Alpha weekend, away um that also really solidified it for me um a lot of things happened that weekend that everything seemed to fall into place um so yeah i think that was probably the turning point if a bit of emotional <laughs> oh, that's really lush and just finally has being a christian made a difference to your life like now in comparison to before yeah definitely i mean my life is completely different ha than how it was before i came back to faith um, I felt very lost and very unsure about what I was meant to be doing next and what my plan was and very um, insecure about my own decisions and worried that I was making big mistakes and all that. And since since coming back to faith, it's been almost like calm. It's been like a calming influence on me. Um, I've been able to make decisions, which is the first time I've been able to do that in years. Um, I applied to university straight afterwards, which I've been umming and ahhing over for quite a long time. And as soon as it happened, I was like, right, I'm going to go for it. Um, I met Marco. Um, so that's obviously changed quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I've just, it's really, everything seems to be falling into place and it's just amazing. Yeah. Oh, Bob, thank you so much. Of course. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Sheila, one of the senior ministers at St George's and it's great to be with you this morning. And after all that rain yesterday, it is so lovely to see some sunshine again. 
we've had the Bible story wonderfully told and enacted by Ben and Alice. So let me begin by reading just one verse from 1 Samuel 16. And a reminder, this is David who becomes King David. And the story is set when he's still a young shepherd boy. And God tells Samuel that David is the one he's to anoint, the one who would become king. Verse 13 says, so as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he'd brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. If you've been around the last couple of weeks, you may have missed our welcome to the lovely Ben and Alice who arrived from Oxford in the midst of this strange time. Ben is our new curate. Uh, he was meant to have been ordained a month ago, but like every other 2020 plan, he's going to need to wait for a bit. But whenever it happens, it's gonna be a real celebration, a very special day for Ben. The whole point of any inauguration to some new sphere of employment is to celebrate the beginning of something special. Most probably, most people probably just start a new job and that's it. But for a king, there's a coronation, for presidents, an inauguration, for college professors, an installation, and for curates, a service of ordination. All solemn but happy recognition of the privileges the promises and the responsibility for the work that the person has been called to. They set a seal upon that person for a public witness of the commitment to the work that they're about to start. It is just the starting point, and then the work itself begins. In this story, David is being anointed to be king over Israel, but there was no public inauguration into office. Saul was still king and was going to remain on the throne for another decade or more. At least Ben won't have to wait that long, I hope. David was anointed by Samuel and then simply went back to the sheep afterwards. And it was some while before things even got to change at all. So what was that anointing all about? How was he ever going to become king? There was already a king who showed no desire to abdicate in favour of a teenage shepherd boy. So what was going on? Well, let's look at a bit of the story just before uh, this, this verse. Saul is king of Israel, but he proved to be someone who was great with the outward bits of, bits of religion, the religious ritual, doing all the religious stuff. But he simply hadn't submitted himself to do God's will. And when Saul didn't follow God's will, and it was pointed out to him, rather than genuine repentance, he just made excuses. And so Samuel, with his prophetic gift, is told by God that he's had enough of Saul as king of Israel. And he's now got a secret errand for Samuel to go to the family chosen to provide the next dynasty. God was commissioning Samuel to do one of the most dangerous and daring things to anoint a new king while the reigning monarch was still alive. But Samuel was obedient to God and is led to Jesse's house. And Jesse brings out his sons one by one, starting with the oldest. They're each stood before Samuel so that Samuel can hear from God if this was the son to be anointed as king of Israel. And each candidate received the divine thumbs down. So Samuel, rather bewildered, asks, are these all the sons you've got? No, says Jesse, there's still the youngest. But he's out tending the sheep. In Israel, seven was a number of perfection. So son number eight may have been considered as an afterthought, the sort of runt of the family. The very fact that Jesse hadn't previously thought even to invite David to come along to this gathering in the presence of the mighty Samuel speaks volumes about how David was seen within the family. So they go and fetch David and Jesse introduces David, the youngest son and shepherd boy, to Samuel, 
who immediately knows this is the future king of Israel. Really? He didn't look much of a king, this boyish face and smelling of sheep. In human eyes, the other sons had got so much more going for them. But in verse 7, Samuel is told by God, the Lord, the Lord doesn't see the things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David was God's choice, and God tells Samuel to anoint David, and we're told from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David with power. We live in a celebrity culture, but God has a way of choosing the most unlikely people. However, God, uh, David rather, at a future date, is able to look back and he's able to say in Psalm 22, Lord, you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust in you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. God had his hand upon David from his very conception. David was able to put down those Beautiful words in Psalm 139. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You watch me as I was formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. David was able to look back and know how God's hand had been upon him and his calling had been right there, right from conception. Do you know that? Do you know that God himself as your creator and father has knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you into this world with a purpose? No matter what your circumstances, no matter what your gender or the colour of your skin or anything else about you, you aren't just a random person. You are not a mistake. It's not about being good enough either. There's lots to show how many times David blew it. It's not about who you are, but it's about whose you are. Have you got that heart knowledge of whose you are, that place of security? And are you discovering something of the Father's purpose for your life? But what about this anointing? What was that all about? Well, that word anointing is used in the Bible in several ways. Here's two of them. First, there is that sense of inauguration, someone being put into office, an outward ritual. And that's the way it's often seen in the Old Testament. When Samuel anointed David, he took a ram's horn filled with freshly pressed olive oil and poured the oil on David's head. And the oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, the secret of God's power. And the second way the Bible uses anointing is in the sense of what happens in a person's heart. In verse 13, it reads, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And far more important than the crown that will eventually be placed on David's head is the inward anointing of the Holy Spirit, God's kingdom authority given to him. When Samuel anointed David, God planted the root we sometimes hear about at Christmas. In Isaiah 11, it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And this root now planted coming from Jesse's family would lead to fruit that changed the world to Jesus himself. In Revelation 22, Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David. So when God raised up this shepherd boy, David, from the family of Jesse, from the tribe of Judah, he was raising up the forerunner of Jesus, his own son. So this event was massive, not only affecting the whole of Israel, but right through to affecting every person for all time. But David's journey wasn't going to be straightforward. 
and the same goes for us. David may have been anointed with the Holy Spirit, but that didn't mean that life would be easy. Testing times would come. David would fall into sin. He'd get things horribly wrong. He'd experience immense battle, followed by wilderness years where his faith would be profoundly shaken. But somehow he emerged from all of this with his faith intact, even strengthened. A real encouragement for any of us going through rubbish times at this moment. And David was a worshipper. He was Israel's first singer of songs, and no doubt in his wilderness times, he was sustained by his commitment to personal prayer and worship. And if you read his wilderness psalms, they're full of expressions of a continuing faithfulness to God, even in the midst of the darker situations. And it's easy to lose sight of God in the wilderness, but David is able to say from his own heart, the Lord is my rock my fortress, my deliverer. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He was going to need to tackle a lot of difficult stuff as king. But with God's anointing, God uses David to change the state of the nation. And if we're going to be part of bringing transformation to the world around us, we need God's Holy Spirit on a daily basis. And one day David would become the greatest king as Israel ever had. But that wouldn't happen for a very long time. And although David had the anointing, Saul still had the crown. So there was David and there was Saul. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, we're told. And in the next verse, the spirit of the Lord has left Saul. There's only one thing that separates David and Saul, and that is repentance. Both David and Saul fell into sin. Both were sorry, but only David truly repented of sin and turned from it to serve the Lord afresh. Repent means not just being sorry, but having a change of heart, a change of direction. Saul rejected God's ways and was unrepentant, and so God rejects Saul. And even Ahab, who was the most evil of kings, was forgiven by God when he came full of remorse and asking for forgiveness. But it seems Saul's problem was pride. As it says, the I that comes in the middle of that word. One day, a penitent David would throw himself on God's mercy with the heart cry of Psalm 51. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So when God sees the tears of repentance, he's moved. But Saul sheds no tears. He rather dug in his heels. And so we're told the spirit of the Lord left Saul. God's ultimate purpose in anointing David was to pave the way for the coming of the true and final king, the Lord Jesus himself. David was to be the first king under the new order. Jesus was to be the last and once for all king of the house of David. And David was to point God's covenant people more clearly than ever before to the coming of the Messiah, who would finally come to defeat the greatest enemy and reveal the depth of God's love for every single human being. God's amazing grace for you and for me. And I know the depth of my thankfulness as I look at how God dealt with David someone far from perfect, but simply knew his need of God. Let's just pray for a moment. Father God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you give your Holy Spirit to every single one of us who turn to you and turn our lives over to you. Come to each of us afresh right where we are now, and fill us. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's worship. And since we've been thinking about David this morning, I'm going to use a number of the Psalms to help us to do that. Uh, David wrote many of the Psalms uh, and he was a worshipper as well as a warrior and a king. So let's begin with Thanksgiving. This is Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So as we begin, Lord, we come with thankfulness. Thankfulness for all your goodness. Thankfulness for the good news of Jesus. Thank you. Thankfulness for the presence of the Spirit in us and amongst us. Just in a moment's quiet, perhaps you might like to bring your thanksgivings to God as we come before him together in prayer. And the thing we need to be most thankful for is the gift of Jesus, his life for us on the cross and the forgiveness he won for us. So let's take a moment to come honestly and openly uh, and to admit to God when we fail to love him with everything that we are 
and where we fail to love our neighbours as ourselves. So in a moment of quiet, let's just be honest before God and confess to him our failures and sins. These are words from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, block out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, creating me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness you freely give us when we simply confess and turn from our sin. Grant us your peace and let us rejoice in that forgiveness now and know the eternal life that you bring. David poured out his complaints to God too. And perhaps for us, particularly at times in this strange season we're living through, we need to express our sense of loss or disappointment or simply that we're feeling overwhelmed and weighed down. And if that's you, uh, let's just have a moment to bring that to God now and be honest about the way that we feel. These are words from Psalm 42. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, Where's your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. And David was concerned for the world that God had made as well. And we have many concerns, concerns for those we love, for our town, our nation, for all that's going on in the world. And so we pray for those in authority grappling with difficult decisions, for those giving themselves to care for others, for all those situations where we long for God to bring justice and healing, mercy and wisdom, and where we long for him to bring light and the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus. Let's bring those prayers for others and for our world in a moment's quiet now. And let's finish with some words from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations on, of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. All these prayers we bring in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. To him be glory and praise forever. Amen. Good morning, church. This is your church challenge for this week. I wonder, can you see the, uh, the beautiful waterfall? on the poster behind me. That's a waterfall from Kurdistan, from Iraq. And underneath it, you can't see very well, there's a map of Lebanon. But I actually do have something else from Lebanon I can show you. Um, I have a piece of one of the cedars of Lebanon. This is the, the cedar wood that is from Lebanon growing that we hear about in the Bible. And it's got a text on it. So. That's from, from Lebanon. I have a few other things too. I have a wonderful flute from Armenia. It's more like a clarinet. It's got a reed. 
but it's a, it makes a, an interesting noise, shall we say. And from South America, here's a, a little um, nativity scene. Uh, you can see Mary and Joseph and a, an animal of some sort. And on the back, it's made of cowhide. And at the front, it's made from the woods of the Chaco, the forests in northern Argentina by indigenous people. And what about Asia? Well, we, we have a little, a little um, frog here that makes a good froggy noise. And that was made in Cambodia. So the challenge is not to collect things from around the world. The challenge this week is to pray for a country that you have never prayed for before. You might say, oh my goodness, but how can I find out information if I don't know, just if it's just the name of a country? Well, if you have, if you're online, you can Google um, Operation World. That will give you lots of information about the country itself and also if there are Christians there and the church and the state of the church. It may not be up to date, but you can still find out how to pray for that country. And if you want to pray specifically for um, persecuted churches, then Barnabas Fund is the, the website to go to. Barnabas Fund have constant updated prayer uh, information about different countries and needs of Christians in different countries, persecuted Christians. Also, there are news websites. Uh, here we have the BBC and they are very good. But if, um, if you wanted to look up your own country, they would have a website. Just ask for that country's news in English and many of them will have an English news website. So what about if, you don't, if you're not online? Can you still do this? Yes. If you decide, if you look in the atlas and just pick a country, if you decide that it's a, a first world country in Europe or North America, Australia, these well, Japan, very um, materially well off countries, then pray for the church, pray for revival in the church, pray for the church reaching out, especially in these uncertain times of coronavirus. If you choose a majority world country, a third world country in Africa or Asia or South America or somewhere else, we do ask you to pray for the church in those places because the churches are always hard pressed if they are very much a minority faith. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's atheism or whether it's um, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Shintoism, Hinduism, all these other things, the church will be hard pressed. So pray for the church, pray for its leaders. So that's your challenge this week. Pray for a country you've never prayed for before and don't give up. Just keep praying. Don't give up after one week. Just keep praying. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you.
amazing. It's been so nice to be part of this live stream this morning. So there are currently some pretty exciting things that are being prepared for. And one of those things is the new wine conference that we can all attend because it's happening online. Um, so I'm now gonna pass over to Alison, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about this. Hi everyone, welcome to Herman the German. Here we are in the camper van, and we're thinking about new wine, which starts next week on Thursday the 30th of July and it goes on until the 3rd of August. Hopefully you will have received a program like this which is sent to you via email and you might have printed it out um, like I have here so that we know what's going on but Edward just wanted to tell you a bit about what's happening with the kids program. There's going to be a kids program at nine o'clock in the morning every single day and it should be really fun also, um, at three o'clock in the afternoon, there is going to be um, another program for kids called Stomping Ground, which should be quite fun. There might be a, some challenges or a scavenger hunt, and it should be really fun. So hopefully you'll be able to dip in to New Wine this year because it's free, it's open to everyone and there's going to be great things available. Every year that we go, we meet with God in amazing ways and we always come back changed. So we're just really excited that you guys can get to dip into it for free this year and um, just see what God is going to do in your lives and we're excited and looking forward to that. So please do get in touch if you want any more information, um, either with myself or Marco, because he knows about the technical side and I don't. But um, I do know that there'll be great things um, available and we just really encourage you to, to tap into it. Thanks, bye. Thank you to our new wine team. They've done a fantastic job of getting information out to us and encouraging us to engage with it. And a reminder that next Sunday we'll be meeting again at 10.30 as usual, but that will lead us straight into the new wine main stage at 11 o'clock. And a reminder too about Miriam's Justice Talks. Uh, it's the usual link at 7.30 tomorrow evening. And if you'd like to have it, if you haven't got it, then contact Miriam or myself and we can send it to you. The prayer team asked me to share with you the following things this morning. First of all, Psalm 62, verses 1 to 2. I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation my fortress where I will never be shaken. Then Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be honoured by every nation. I will be honoured throughout the world. And then finally, Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are call, called according to his purpose for them. A reminder that as people, uh, we need pause points and our rest should be in God and to take those things we've learned into uh, the lockdown, from the lockdown into our new normal. And someone had a picture of a steering wheel with someone gripping onto it with words uh, to hand over the wheel to God and to trust him. That God should be our steering wheel, not our spare tire. If there's anything uh, from this morning that God has been saying or doing or any particular things you'd like someone to pray with you over, uh, why not chat with someone else, phone a friend, ask them to pray for you, or else get in touch with the prayer team on prayer at stgdeal.org. And as we go out into our week, let's be trusting in God's faithfulness and being filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to step out in faith and kingdom authority wherever we have that opportunity. Let me lead you now in a final prayer. Father God, we thank you that you take these earthenware vessels of our lives and you fill them with your spirit. We pray in this coming week that you will meet with us in our needs and no matter what our circumstances, you will use us to build your kingdom wherever we are. Take us and use us for your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good week and God bless.